All right, welcome everybody. Tonight's topic for Mathematic Education Consultant is Field Follies and Burden to Pearls. And the reason Greg and I had uh, put this lecture together was that we we're getting feedback uh, on our surveys, what do you want to talk to what we'd like to talk about. And we kept getting comments uh, about interpreting visual fields. Now, either a lot of people were interested in it or one person kept asking again and again. But that was what we wanted to do today. We wanted to uh, talk about perimetry. We have we both have a, a strong interest in it, a lot of experience in it. We can talk about what a lot, a lot of things mean. Now, these are my disclosures. I'm a consultant on a number of uh, uh, companies, including Novartis, Glockos, Allergan, Zeiss, Gary, Oculus Therapeutics, and Bausch and Loan. But I have no financial interest in any product we might discuss. I am a co-owner of Optometric Education Consultants with uh, with Greg. Greg, these are your just new disclosures. Yep, and uh, just everyone knows that uh, the content of this was prepared independently by me and and Joe. You can see my companies I've lectured there for in the last year, anywhere from Alcon to Optiview. I do sit on a few advisory boards from Allergan to Dompe listed there. I do sit as the PA medical director, which is a managed Medicaid for Pennsylvania. I am the chairman of the advisory council for healthcare registries. Uh, just like Joe, I have no direct financial proprietary interest in any of the companies or services mentioned tonight. And more importantly, the content and format of this course is presented without commercial bias and does not claim any superiority over any one product or the other. And Joe already took care of this. I am the other half of Optometric Education Consultants. And just to uh, to emphasize, this lecture is going to focus on Humphrey visual field analysis, as this is the most common form of perimetry, the most modality that we that we both use the most. But these discussions are going to be applying across many uh, brand, uh, other branded devices. So nothing we talk about should be construed that this technology is superior to any other form of perimetry. Anything we include or exclude about per parametric technologies neither imply superiority or inferiority. It only is reflective of our personal experience. So we're going to start polling question number one. And Greg, do you recognize this? Um, background? Uh, I do. That's Mall of America. So what parametric device do you currently use? Humphrey Field Analyzer? Humphrey FTT perimeter, FT, FDT matrix perimeter, Essler automated perimeter, Oculus of some sort. I use something else. I'm not sure what I use. And I, I don't have a field unit in my office. Looks like looks like polling is closed, Greg. I think we have to relaunch that. All right, let's try that again. All right. It looks like we're going to get some. Uh... Now we're clicking. I knew something was wrong. So, what device do you currently use? Hey, we're moving along quite quickly, Greg. Yeah, it's, I think everyone's experience at these polling questions, which is nice. All right, so let me end the poll and I'll share those results. And, uh, and just as we suspected there, Joe, still Humphrey is leading the, the field, even though there's some newer instruments out there, um, some exciting technology coming down the pipeline, but looks like our uh, presentation will be right spot on for at least 64%. Um, and, a lot, and, a, and, a, and these devices are all are all very really very uh, very good devices. Well, talking about perimetry, we need to talk about some of the mechanics and, and the physiology, path of the uh, psychophysiology. The we have is the island of vision. So the closest that we're gonna we get to fixation, the the, the maximum phobia, is gonna ha have the highest sensitivity, meaning that it's gonna be able to detect the the dimmest light on white on white perimetry. And as we go more eccentrically, it's going to start falling off. And it goes further further out, it goes quite a way out temporally. And we see how much it goes nasally. And of course, 
in this halo of vision, there is a hole which is represented at the optic nerve with physiologic blind spot. So we always look at this hill of vision. Now, there's some normal visual field parameters, Greg. Why don't you talk about those a little bit? What are our limitations on the parameters? Yeah, so, you know, the no normal visual field parameters, when you look at the visual field there on the picture, you can see, um, I'm hoping my pointer is showing up. Um, you can see here in the gray area it would represent maybe the normal visual field, barring any uh, retina or orbit uh, mo um, margins. So you can see here that you know superior goes uh, uh, 60 degrees, nasal goes 60 degrees, inferior goes 75, and uh, temporal goes 100 degrees. But really, superior doesn't really get to 60 unless it's kind of more of a superior uh, temporal type of 60. So that's just your limitations. Just remember superior nasal or 60, inferior is a little bit larger at 75 and um, the temporal goes out to 100 degrees. The macula makes up 13 degrees of that and the fovea is three degrees and the visual field is limited by retina and margins of the orbit. Now, the parametric principles is what it is called the frequency of seeing curve or, or threshold. And what is the frequency of seeing? That, that curve is that point, that sensitivity where the patient will see it 50% of the time and 50% of the time they won't see it. That's true threshold. And this is determined parametrically by presenting lights that are very, very bright comparatively as to what the patient should be able to see, and then something that is too dim for them to be expected to see, and it will come down not quite as dim and a little brighter into what is called this, the staircase method. And in the staircase method, what will happen is they try to plot the frequency of frequency of seeing curve with 50, where that value, where 50% of the time the patient will see it, 50% of the time they won't see it, that's true threshold. Now, to do that for all 50 some or 70 some points is very laborious. You know, they, they have to accept a certain degree of, of uncertainty. And Greg, you wanna talk about the staircase method of, of perimetry? How it, uh, it, will, it, will, it will actually cross that threshold. How many times do, do, the, do the strategies cross, Greg? Well, the 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 CETA fast will cross one time, uh, and the CETA uh, standard will cross two times. So the CETA standard becomes a little bit more accurate, and that's why when we get to the glaucoma part, I typically do a CETA standard because it will cross the threshold twice to narrow down that uh, that threshold. Now, I think it's actually important to understand CETA. That that's the Swedish interacting threshold algorithm. And that, that, that device, that, that parametric algorithm, it asks smart questions. It kind of knows where to start based upon information in there. But there's something called an ERF or an error related factor. Plotting each, you know, each point exactly is very time consuming and laborious. CETA will accept a certain degree of uncertainty. And when it reaches that degree of uncertainty, it will stop. Now, CETA fast accepts a greater degree of uncertainty. So the, the difference, as Greg pointed out, CETA standard will actually cross threshold more than CETA fast. And CETA fast will accept a greater degree of uncertainty as to where the exact threshold is. So CETA fast makes actually a very good screening tool. Uh, it's good for neuroophthalmic diseases, which are not subtle. It's good when you know that somebody is, you expect them to be normal, you want to prove that they're normal. But for more accuracy, the CETA standard tends to be a little, little bit tighter. Greg, why don't you share your pearls here on static perimetry? Yeah, so most visual fields out there uh, will go uh, anywhere from zero, which is the brightest light, and to 51 decibels, which is the dimmest light. But what we need to realize is that when we use decibels is that anywhere from 41 to 51 decibels is outside the human vision. 
And that becomes important when you start looking at the visual field. You know, Joe knows that one of my, uh, you know, my pet peeves is people will say, you just look at the pattern, you just look at this, you just look at this part of the visual field, just do the grayscale, don't use the grayscale, don't ever look. You got to use the whole visual field when you interpret it. You know, is one, does this relate to that? And is this helping you out? Is this patient trigger happy falling asleep? So one of the easiest things to do is just look at the raw data. And if you're seeing the raw data in the 40s, you know, 41, 45, 43, the patient is probably trigger happy because that's outside. That light, that dim light is outside the range of human vision. So that's, you know, that's just looking at the raw data. When it comes to refractive error, and this is important in glaucoma because I see my glaucoma patients anywhere from three, four, six, or once a year. So if I'm seeing patients every three, every three, four, six uh, times a year, or every six, three to four, six, three, four, or six months, so twice a year up to four times a year, I'm not really doing a refraction on these patients. And if they're glaucoma patients and they're suffering from cataracts, they could have a refractive shift. And I'm not refracting them all the time. Sometimes they'll come in and they might be 2020 minus, maybe they're 2025, they're happy with their glasses. But then we go and do a visual field. And then you can see here that one diopter of refractive blur in an undilated patient can create a little more than one decibel of uh, depression on the hill of vision. So we wanna make sure the whole point of that is make sure that if they're doing a visual field or a glaucoma patient or any really any patient, um, but especially glaucoma that, you know, at least have your technician run an auto refractor compare it to their current glasses. And it seems to be off maybe a quick refraction before doing the visual field. Now, what does that mean for cylinder? Well, when you come to cylinder, you're allowed to up to two diopters uncorrected, or you can then start at two diopters uh, using the spherical equivalent. When you get above two diopters, make sure you're putting that in the trial lens. So anything, let me, re, let me rephrase that because I think I kind of jumbled that up a little bit is that if it's is anywhere from two diopters or less, make sure you use the spherical equivalent. Anything two diopters or more, make sure you're putting that in the trial lens. And then we all went to school and we learned about you know, the back. You know, I thought I was going to have to know this for some scientific reason or use it in clinic every day that the back of the, you know, the, the visual field is 31 apostilbs. It's lit up. And the reason why they light the back, the visual field up is to put the patient in a photopic range. They're not dark adapted for lack of a better term. They're in a photopic system, which is now isolating the cones, which is now uh, gonna be less dependent on pupil size, crystalline lens color, uh, transparency of the media. Um, you're more on contrast rather than absolute brightness. So. The back of the visual field is lit, and then you're putting a white on white stimulus on it. Um, but it's just to really kind of, in, in a sense, make it less dependent or more accurate and less dependent on people's size, crystalline lens, and transparency. So Excellent. those Greg, are some thank pearls. You. Well, it's time for polling question number two. And Greg, do you recognize this area? Um, looks like there was a place where the golf match was uh, played today, the players. It is, it's Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida. My main field test is a 24-2, 30-2, and dash 2 120-point full field screening, something else where I don't have a field instrument. All right, rolling in there nicely. Beautiful. 24-2, 30-2, 10-2, 120, something else. And I don't have a visual field instrument. And I think we're good. I think we're good too. If we can share the results. Okay, sharing away. And the go to out there is a 24 2, followed up by 30 2. And then looks like third place is something else. And then a a uh, 20, 120 point visual screening. And right. I, I, I think that is really pretty, uh, that is really pretty typical and representative, very representative. So 
So why don't you talk about these 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 tests, Greg? What is twenty four dash two? What is thirty dash two? So when you're looking at a thirty dash two, I was a geek one time and counted all these spots, and there's seventy six locations, and a twenty four dash two just fifty four locations. I think the biggest uh, point that I'd like to point out, if you just look at this visual field in the upper right hand corner. Even though it's small, I don't even have to look to tell whether or not it's a 24-2 or a 30-2. I can tell just by looking at seeing that it goes superiorly 24, it goes temporally 24 and inferior 24 that degrees. And then over here nasally, it's going 30 degrees. And that's the biggest thing that I like to point out is on a 24-2, it's 24 in all uh, superior, inferior, and temporal, it just goes 30 degrees nasally because that's what we want to use for a, uh, a glaucoma visual field because that nasal defects, we want to go out to 30 degrees. So there's 54 spots on a 24-2. 24-2 has become the visual field for glaucoma because only a small percentage of glaucoma defects occur in the peripheral part of the visual field. And the only downside that I've been able to find in literature is that if you do a 30-2, you might be able to pick up progression a little bit earlier um, with a few more test points. But picking up all the, uh, the rim defects that can occur from the trial lens um, or maybe even orbits or eyelids kind of throws that out of the water. So that's why you know, most glaucoma docs that are out there, they'll do a 24-2 for their glaucoma. Again, remembering that it goes out to 30 degrees in that nasal field. So you want to talk about the 10-2? Yeah, the 10-2 it is good for macular disease and advanced glaucoma, as we can see in the, uh, the lower right. Yeah, it measures 10 degrees temporally nasally and it's testing 68 points. So in a 24-2 and a 30-2, there is a great degree of separate six degrees. This goes down to about two degrees. So this is very good in, in isolating the remaining fixation that the patient has uh, when they have central, paracentral, or extremely constricted visual fields. What will happen is we need to go to the N-2. And this is just laying, you know, laying out a, a picture of, of how it's basically being tested on a, on a 24-2. Now, Greg, I don't know if we ever talked about this, you're aware about, but where this former president, uh, George H.W. Bush, referred to a thousand points of light in uh, many of his uh, addresses. And it's widely thought that this was based upon him doing visual field because he had exfoliated glaucoma. And we can see him shaking hands with Dr. Harry Quigley, who is a noted glaucoma specialist out of, out of Johns Hopkins, Wilmer Eye Institute. Who was his personal doctor? So, you know, he went through a visual field test and all the little flashing lights, and he came up with this uh, this illusion about a thousand points of light based upon doing visual fields. So, and we can so Joe, we have a question that rolled in yes. here, and mm -hmm. it says, "To be clear, an emetrope needs no lens or gets the reading lens of plus two uh, and a quarter. Is the room lights?" on or off. So when it comes to an emetrope, it's a little tricky because it, it's going to be whether they're presbyopic or not, or if they're dilated. So I like to do my visual fields uh, undilated. Um, maybe if I'm dilating the patient that day on a rare occasion, um, while the technician is just getting ready to start the other visual field going in between eyes, maybe I'll have them dilate. Um, but an emetrope that's non-presbyopic does not need a lens. If they're presbyopic, they're going to need some to see like that. I think that bowl is about set for three diopters. So if they're an absolute presbyopic, I think you'll need like a, anywhere from a 250 to a three. Um, but if they're 45, they only might need a one, uh, 175. So an emetrope is going to be based on whether they're presbyopic or not. And then if you dilate a 25 year old, then you're gonna probably need some type of lens in there for them to see the back of the, of the field. 
room lights, you know, on or off, uh, just whatever you start in with my visual field. And I think most visual fields will self adjust the back of the bowl to that 31.5 apostoles. So, you know, I think if you turn it on and off in the room, it will automatically adjust with what's happening around it. So just, I would just instruct the pay or instruct the technician, you know, don't be like on and off and on and off during the test, just kind of keep it consistent throughout. Just don't turn it on and off. Um, again, it will adjust uh, with the, the, to make it the 31 apostille. So um, it doesn't matter if room lights are on and off. Um, and then someone's asking about the 24-2C. I believe that's only on the, the, the Humphrey visual field. And the 24 dash two C, Joe, do you have it coming up? I don't know if you have it in the slide. Deck. I, I, I actually do not, so go right ahead. Okay, so the 24 dash two C is a uh, is a threshold that is used for glaucoma. And when you do, do a 24 dash two on someone that has glaucoma, that doesn't mean that they're free of a visual field defect. Um, their macula could be uh, affected. So you do a 24-2 white on white, especially if you have some nerve fiber layer dropout, some GCC loss, um, you know, you're, you, you have a notch in a rim, you had a trans hemorrhage, um, you're, you're suspecting that there could potentially be a visual field defect, you do white on white and it's clear. Well, do a 10-2. Now that means four visual fields, right? Well, you know, one for each eye, so a total of four. So the glaucoma gurus, and I, I have the the study, and it's stick, you know, the, the, all the names are 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 are, are slipping me. Um, but there is like six guys that you, when you read about visual fields, they all got together and looked at the ten two, in which points are most likely going to show up on a glaucomatous visual field. So they took those 10 points and then merged them into a 24-2. So when you see, and it's kind of a C shape, so that's where the 24-2 C got its name, but it's basically taking 10 points from a 10-2, putting them into a 24-2, so it gets you away from doing, um, uh, having to do four visual fields. I usually use that threshold strategy once the patient graduates from a 10, uh, a 24-2 C to the standard, and they're really, really good, um, and I can trust them. Then I'll go over to a 24-2 C because that runs on a C to faster strategy, and I think we're going to talk about that, right, Joe? Yes. Okay. You know, we talked about C to standard and C to fast, and the biggest difference is C to fast actually accepts a greater degree of uncertainty as to where to stop. And thus it makes it a little bit less accurate and a little bit less reliable. It's a good screening test. Now we have C to faster. And it's very, very similar to C to standard, but it doesn't do blind spot monitoring or test for false negatives. Thus it can have very good accuracy at a, at a quicker time point. That's a great screening test. It's a very good test uh, in glaucoma patients uh, who are not advanced or, or can't sit for a longer one. It is probably better than C to fast. If you have C to fast stir, I think C to fast is gonna fall, uh, fall by the wayside, so to speak. Great, that brings me to the polling question, next polling question. Do you recognize where that is? Just make sure I have the right one up. Is it polling question? No, I think it's polling yeah. four. Are we on? Nope, we oh, are. Sorry. Okay. We're good. We're in three. All right. I want to make My sure. preferred testing strategy is full threshold, see the standard, see the fast, see the faster, blue, yellow, something else, or I'm not sure. I do recognize that. Uh, that's Mackinac Island up in Michigan. Um, I think that's the Mission Point uh, Inn. Indeed. My preferred strategy threshold, got it. All right, I'm gonna end the poll so everyone get their point in. And I'm gonna share the results. See the standard, uh, edges out, see the fast. 
Uh, some people are using C the faster. You have to have one of the newer devices they have that in there. I don't see anybody using blue yellow perimetry. Uh, interestingly, that is something that's been around for nearly 30 years. It really hasn't caught on. And there's some people who are still using uh, full threshold uh, visual fields, which are, of course, you know, very, you know, very, very accurate. With the CETA um, pr uh, programming, that's what killed the blue yellow um, is because they found, you know, back in the day, it was based on reduced redundancy where you have less blue uh, cones compared to green and uh, red. And so the thought process was you'll pick, you know, if you're killing off retinal ganglion cells, you're going to pick off, you know, a few more blue. And, um, and so that would show up a little bit earlier. And that was true before, uh, before the CETA program came out. And then they found out that white on white CETA was just as sensitive as the blue on yellow, just for everyone that FYI that's out there. Uh, Greg, I know you like turning phobial threshold on. Why don't you talk about what, what, that is, what that means and why you like doing that? Yeah, I like uh, the phobial threshold on. It's kind of a little warm up for the patient. It begins for the technician that's experienced in giving the visual field. They can see if the patient is, is getting the visual field. Uh, remember that a perfect macula, someone that is, you know, maybe 18 or 19 years old, perfectly clear media, understanding what they're doing, they might get to 40 decibels. So, you know, you get a technician that you train and they're doing fovea on and they're getting 43 decibels. Um, that's a pretty dim light, you know, especially if they're in their 40s or 50s or in their 60s or 70s and have some media opacity. That's a pretty dim light that they're going to be able to see. So it just kind of starts off by maybe educating the patient. So I like having the fovea on. Um, the, it can uh, it can it correlates with the uh, with the visual acuity. Um, so someone that's around 2020 would be about 37 decibels. You know, someone that's uh, you know, maybe 20, um, say 2025, 2030. Remember, it needs to be a little bit of a, of a brighter light. So it's going to be down and around maybe that 34 decibel. So I just like it because I can look at the acuity. I can look and see if the patient's getting the, the test. My technician can stop the test, re-educate them before going into the full, to, to the full strategy. Um, you know, they say that, you know, that if it's decreased a little bit, you might be picking up an early glaucoma, maybe some plaquenil toxicity uh, when you have the foveal threshold on. So if they're, if they're lower, you might have a glaucoma uh, a patient or maybe some plaquenil toxicity. And I think the part of the uh, slide that's not showing there, Joe, is the 34 decibels and the, uh, um, and the reference. I'm not sure if that's the slide or not, but it should be coming up. There it is. So 47% of the patients with 2020 vision had 37 decibels. It's been repeated multiple times. And there's just one of the uh, studies there that references that. So, you know, as, as, as Greg mentioned, a good refraction is cataracts and cause shifts. You know, 24-2 is uh, a very commonly used one for glaucoma. See, the standard tends to be good, not fast. Faster may actually be reasonable, probably on. As Greg says, you know, see the faster on the experienced visual field taker, sometimes they, they earn the right to do an easier test. Now, interpreting visual fields, you know, we used to say reliable or, or unreliable. Here's like a yes or no, very, very black and white. We, we really aren't doing that any longer. Uh, and there's no, there's no standard that we all compare against, but we really don't say reliable or unreliable. It's more a continuum from highly reliable to marginally informative to no useful information. So a visual field doesn't have to be perfect. There is no consensus as to what is, what is reliable or unreliable. We have to look at what information it's giving us and how well we can use it. Now, Greg, I know you say false positives are more destructive to interpretation. Uh, that, I think that's one thing, and I'll, I'll come to it a little bit later. I, I think that's one area that you and I might disagree on. I knew false positives are problematic, but I can accept a, a number of false positives when I, when I look at the overall test pattern. But why do, you, why, do you, why do you not like the false positives so much? 
Yeah, because whenever it's a false positive, and we might have some examples whenever we go through and start looking at some of the visual fields, the the algorithm is such that it takes all the data in 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 the uh, database, and whenever it adjusts the visual field, if someone's really really high, it just pushes it down, or it can push push it down a lot more. So a, f a false positive uh, in order to get it to the um, whenever it starts to adjust can really destroy the visual field. Now, a lot of people think that false negatives are bad for visual field. But if you think about it, false negatives are allowed to be slightly higher when you're talking about a glaucomatous visual field and, and false positives are bad on the glaucomatous visual field because it throws off the false positives throw off the way the, the, the adjustments are made. False negatives have been found to be okay because if we think about how a retinal ganglion cell dies, it doesn't go from being perfectly good from glaucomatous, def, you know, glaucomatous stress to a dead ganglion cell. What happens is it becomes stressed, a little bit more stressed, more stressed and then it reaches a point where it's gonna die and, it, and there's no re return. So, but when, when there's retinal ganglion cells in glaucoma, we've got some that are gonna die and some that are wounded. So when you threshold a wounded um, retinal ganglion cell, it takes a little time to recover more than it does if it was normal, but it's still alive so you're gonna get some people that have some false negatives. That's why false negatives are okay. And then that's actually kind of cool. Maybe we'll see as we go through here, look at some progression analysis. I have patients that had like a minus four on the mean deviation, glaucoma, you treat them, you take the stress off and those retinal ganglion cells that were stressed are now recovered and maybe back to normal you'll see that visual field drift up and get better. Maybe don't mind the street, it's not gonna go back to zero, but it's because the false negatives are okay because you're testing a wounded, but false positives just throw off the visual field interpretation. And then gaze tracking is, is typically a little bit better to follow than the blind spot, because how many times has the, the, the blind spot been threshold and found at the beginning of the test, the patient's hard to hear, and they'll have their head in the chin rest and the technician will say something and they'll go, oh, what did you say? They'll take their head out. And after they just, you know, threshold that blind spot. So, you know, they move or then they settle in and get comfortable. So you typically, we rely on the, uh, the gaze tracker more than the blind spot. And then again, progression. It's not really whether it's present or absent. It's just whether everyone's going to progress to some rate, get better, get worse. It's just, is it acceptable rate of change? And then we're gonna talk about this a little bit more, but uh, the first thing I'm gonna point out is when we start looking at a visual field, you know, zero is normal. I'm sure Joe has in the slide deck, you know, what's considered a blind eye. But when you start looking at a visual field, just someone getting the five decibels, which is a mild to moderate defect when you get the five, Patients read slower. They don't leave the home as they don't leave their home as much. They walk slower, and there's increase in car accidents. So just when we start looking at these numbers on the mean deviation, something as 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 mild as five is read slower, don't leave home, walk slower, and increase car accidents. So let's keep that in mind as we look at some visual fields. And yeah, the primers are all you know in in, in many ways. Uh... The, the same principle where the patient has a chin rest, they have a, a, a way to trigger, they have a target, and this is how it's all assessed. They do need a, a near correction. It will tell you what, what to use. Obviously, this is a, a, a bad example because that gives you the, uh, the ring scotoma, and it really should be just as close to the eye as possible. Now, here's something that has been out in, in mainstream media, uh, for patients for a very long time, and this is this, this is problematic. And we have normal vision, we have early glaucoma, we have advanced glaucoma, we have extreme glaucoma. Where you know they talk about tunnel visions coming in and coming in and coming in. The patient can look at and say, oh, "I don't have that, so I, I must be fine." The problem is this is not what glaucoma patients see. This is actually what they see. 
they, they develop these scotomas, things go missing. The brain fills in the fuzz. Patients don't see black. You know, they're, they're, they're not seeing black. They're not seeing what's there. There's a fuzz. The, the patient's brain is, is filling things in. As we can see here, somebody is normal. They get a full visual field. An arthritis can tell them what happens. The kids aren't there. All right? the, the car isn't there. It's not a black spot. It's just they don't see it. And with more advanced disease, the kids aren't there. The car isn't there. The building isn't there. It's missing. So I think this is a, a, a bad representation. Here's a, here's a situation. They're not, they're not seeing black. See, the visual field, they portray it as black. Patients don't see that. Right? Patients, they just don't see anything there. You know, this is, this is not going to end well for grandma because the patient doesn't see her crossing the street. And here's an example of a patient I had seen uh, some time ago. It, I mean, this is, I mean, if you're going to have advanced disease, which is what he had, this is the best situation. If you look at this, I call this glaucoma model vision. One eye, one eye for distance, one eye for near. Both eyes open. This is, this is a person who has advanced disease. Both eyes open. He's got essentially a full visual field. And it's really quite, uh, really quite functional. Leave that visual field up, Joe, because one of the very first questions that rolled in at 713 was, can you spend a few seconds on the Esterman visual field? And the Esterman visual field uh, was uh, was made by Dr. I believe Dr. Esterman. I think his first name was Ben, probably a doc. Um, uh, Esterman. And it was it's basically a binocular visual field. And you, and the reason why I want to do this is because this patient would probably pass the Esterman visual field. Mm -hmm. So you would do the, the Esterman visual field. I know it's on the Humphrey, it might be on other visual fields. Um, and it's a, it's a test mainly for driver's license. I know in Pennsylvania, you have to be able to see 140 degrees, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so you're not really going to do it on a on a 24-2 and try and look at it and interpret it and see maybe if you ran two of them and they don't have any visual field defect. But if someone has a visual field defect, the Esterman is a binocular visual field that, that could be used to test for driver's license. And um, this was just a good timing because I bet that this person here would pass an Esterman visual field with flying colors because it's binocular one eye would help the other. Absolutely. Both eyes open, it's got a full field. Now let's really get to the meat of what people have asking have been asking us to do is how to interpret the single field analysis. What what do these things all mean? Let's 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 talk about it. And great, you know, you really said it properly when you said we have to look at everything. There's there's no one thing. I know people always jump down to the pattern deviation, but let, let's just take on a on a step by step. One of the first things you want to do is. And we talked about reliability earlier, but look at the reliability parameters. You have, you have the fixation losses. That, that's based upon blind spot. And as Greg said, you know, the machine knows where the blind spot should be. And it'll test the blind spot. And it'll put a signal there. If the patient doesn't see it, it determines, well, that's correct. But of course, as you said, Greg, a patient could get a little hitch in there. They can change it, change it a little bit. And now what used to be non-seeing becomes seen. And that's interpreted by the machine. The patient's looking all around. That's not really true. The, the most impressive part would be what the perimeter says. The perimeter says, now oh, the patient was looking around. I saw the eye. Well, then that's real. But they say, no, they, they seem to maintain fixation. Well, that is a pseudo loss of fixation. And if, it's, if it comes out with low reliability, because of fixation losses, I, I've already said, if I threw every, every visual field out and said that, I'd have no visual fields. False negative is more, a, as you said, a, a representation of the eye rather than the, the patient. We always said the patients who had a high degree of false negatives were those that were becoming inattentive or, or falling asleep. Now, if the perpetrator said, yeah, their eyes were closed, or they, their eyes were, were drooping. Okay, that's probably legitimate. But you know, in any one of these points here, one, once a point is damaged and it reaches 50% of its original sensitivity, 
Subsequent testing will range anywhere from no perception of light to full perception of light. Hence, a high degree of variability, of in, in, intra-test variability. And that happens, as, as, you know, as you say, Greg, in areas that are diseased and stressed. Now, these points here may be highly variable. So newer, newer devices are, are really just dropping false negatives because it's more, more representative of, of the eye. And Bo Bankston did a very, very easy, very elegant study several years ago looking at patients with true unilateral glaucoma, traumatic glaucoma or uveitic or, or, or some sort of true unilateral glaucoma. They test good eye first, bad eye first. And the glaucoma eye had high degree of false negative, negative in, in experienced field takers. The normal eye had low degree. And that was really more representative of the eye. And these were calculated by, after the fact, once the patient goes through, the machine will calculate those points that the patient didn't see where they should have seen it based upon the final, the final analysis. And that shows up as a false negative. So it'll see, it'll determine what the patient should have seen. No, I don't have it, I don't have it coming through my hearing edge. You got it, Greg? How do you turn it up? I so, got it. Thank you. So it knows at the, after the test is over, what pa the patient what the patient did see threshold. If they, they missed something they should have seen, it comes up as a false negative. Now, false positive, the machine knows that there is a range of acceptability in terms of response. That there's a range of time that a patient can respond. If they respond too soon, they're not responding to the light. If they respond too late, they're not responding to the light. That becomes a false positive. That usually is a person who might be a little bit trigger happy, they're not responding to the stimulant, responding to uh, other things. Sometimes responding to anxiety and uh, imagination that will raise up the hill of vision sometimes unacceptably. Now, Greg, here's where you and I differ. I know you, you really think that it, it's the most important, the most devastating to interpretation. I have had patients with significant number of false positives where I can tell it actually pretty well represented the uh, the true visual field because I, I had prior visual fields. I, I interpret it as ca cautionary, but I can accept some false positives. Now, from there, we, we determine how much usable information is. Is it, is it highly useful information? Is it marginally useful? Or is it no useful information based upon what we see here? Then we look at the raw data. And these are in decibels. And what this means is what the patient saw, what, what stimulus the patient saw. And the stimulus the patient sees, the higher the number, the dimmer the light, the greater the sensitivity at each point. Now, these are all very good numbers, but I don't know exactly what it means in any situation with any patient. These, these are the, the actual values from the patient. They saw 30 decibels, so you know how tight it is in there. 30 decibels here means they, they saw a very dim light or this is a very sensitive area. Over here, less than zero. The brightest light that the machine can give, they weren't able to see it. Important information, but limited information at this point. Now we have the grayscale. The grayscale is useful. You can pick up, and I have picked up numerous neurological issues that show up better on the grayscale than they do anywhere else. But there is a misrepresentation where this is, where loss of visual field is, is put off as being black. And it really isn't black. It really should be a purely white area to be realistic, but black is what is not seen, but we know the patient doesn't see that. You know, we're all taught that the, the grayscales we put where we put our coffee cup, we don't pay attention to it. I think is actually very valuable. I, I, I will look at it. It gives good patterns. It's better than just for patient education. It helps me find neurologic disease. Now, we have to go to the total deviation in probability display. And that's what we have right down here. 
Now that number, let's say 20, let's say 23 right there. I don't know exactly what that means. So I go down, all right, let me pick, let me pick a, let me pick a better number here. Let me pick this, tw this 24 right there. I look down there and I try to figure out what, what does that mean? I go down here and it looks like it's a minus six. That means when this, is, this visual field is compared to a normal visual field of a person at the same age, that 24 right there is six decibels lower than a normal, normal person at the same age. All right. So I know how much it differs, but I still don't know exactly what that means. So I have to look at this probability display. That 24, which is six decibels lower, is, is represented by a complete black square. And that is corresponding to a probability less than 0.5%. What that means is this value, which is this low, will be found in a normal population or a normal person, but it will be happen less than a half a percent of time. Now, it doesn't say there's disease there. What it's saying is it's statistically very unlikely to, to be found in a normal situation. Ergo, we make the determination this is abnormal and it may meet the criteria for true disease. Now, this total deviation is actually age matched. But that's all it is. It's, it's only age matched. Now, there are other things that affect the visual field. Myosis does it, media opacities do it, cataract does it. I don't really necessarily want to know what's happening from cataract. I want to know what is the true retro lenticular visual field loss. And as such, I have to look at the pattern deviation and its probability display. Now, what will happen going from here, total deviation to pattern deviation? The device will actually look at all the values here and it will determine what, what is the 85th percentile point in this patient's visual field. So it determines the 85th percentile point. And then it compares it to the 85th percentile point of a normal person. And if that value is lower, it will actually raise up the visual field by the difference. It looks, it looks for that degree of field loss that is uniform across the whole visual field and is determined to be something like cataract. So it will filter this off out or, or essentially curve the grade and raise it up a little bit. So that's how it filters out the effects of cataract. And again, it tells us now that minus six has gone to a minus five. So it, it has filtered out maybe a decibel of cataract in, in that point. Still, I have to figure out what that means in a non-Gaussian probability. I still go down here. And interestingly, that point has actually got a little bit sh less shade. So it's now at a probability of one, less than 1%, meaning this value that we found here in a normal population, compared to, uh, in an age matched population, moving out the effects of uniform depression, which is cataract, is going to be found in less than 1% of the population, meaning it's not statistically likely to be normal, but we, it won't say it's abnormal. We make that interpretation. So understanding how total deviation becomes pattern deviation, it looks at the 85th percentile point of the patient's data, compares it to the 85th percentile point of a normal person, and if it's lower, it'll raise it up to match. And that's is filtering out the diffuse loss, which represents cataract. Now, this is probably the best representation of the true retro lenticular visual field loss. Now, there's still a lot more to look at. The glaucoma hemifield test. This is 
This is computer assisted interpretation. So what will happen, I'm, I'm going to have to jump up a little bit. The glaucoma, it, the glaucoma hemifield test, it breaks the superior and inferior hemifields into patterns. We can see there are mirror images. We have, we have 1A and 1B, 2A and 2B, 4A and 4B, 3A and 3B, 5A and 5B. It will actually look at all these points and it will assign a score based upon what the patient's responses were. So everything will be given, you know, above and below will be given because glaucoma is a disease of asymmetry. It will assign a score to each of these, these zones. And then they'll compare the match zones, 2A to 2B, 5A to 5B, 4A to 4B, 3A to 3B. They'll make the comparison above and below. So when it does that, it's going to make a determination. Now, if any of the, if the difference between two match zones, such as 1A and 1B, if the score that's assigned based upon the patient's test results, if that is different, and that difference is going to be found in less than 1% of the population, it's going to say outside normal limits. So it's looking, it's looking at the difference between these points. Now, for example, 2A and 2B, this is giving a score, this is giving a score, this is giving a score, they compare them. If the difference between the scores of each of those, any of them, any of the match pairs, is going to be, is so great that it's going to be found in less than 1% of normal people outside normal limits. Now, let's say 3A and 3B are about the same, but they're really bad. All right? If they are relatively the same, there's no difference, but they're so low, they're gonna be found in less than a half a percent of normal people. It will also say outside normal limits. Greg, does that make sense? It that does. Good? Yep, okay. that was good. And Joe, I, I shared the handouts while you were doing that. So just to let everyone know, two handouts, six slides per page. And Joe, you looks like you added a few extra notes. Do you want to explain what the second handout is? Yeah, that is going to explain everything that I'm explaining right now. And a lot of that were, were, is, is in the Humphrey Field for, uh, Analyzer Primer by Mike Patel, who was an optometrist who invented the uh, Humphrey Perimeter and uh, Anders Heil. So not exactly my words, but it's, it's a good resource. Now, let's say we have a difference in 2A and 2B. And the difference is only about 3% of the population. It's not as bad, but it's still a difference that's only going to be found in less than 3% of the population. It's going to tell us borderline. So it'll tell us at that point, it'll be borderline. And I tell you, GHT borderline is pretty significant. Now, if Going from total deviation to pattern deviation, if the difference is so significant, I mean, and the patient's values are so low that they really have to elevate that diffuse depression, they really have to really bring it up. And that degree is going to be found in less than a half a percent of the population it's going to say general reduction of sensitivity. That means cataract. So if the 85th percentile point of this patient is very low compared to a normal patient, I mean, there's a lot of diffuse depression equally across the whole visual field. It's going to say general reduction of sensitivity, cataract. Very clear. Now, let's say it goes the other way. Let's say the patient is actually super sensitive. Now, some people can be a little bit super sensitive, but only by a little bit. And it actually has to bring it down that the patient's values are above the normal population. And so above that you're only gonna find that in less than half a percent of normal people, it's gonna say abnormally high sensitivity. Greg, to me, that is the worst. 
That's going to be associated probably with high false positives, a mean deviation that is plus, white scotomas that are out there. And when it says abnormally high sensitivity, it's not useful information. You can't use that. Now, if none of those criteria are met, what does it say? It's within normal limits. Now, can a person be within normal limits and be abnormal? Yes, that can happen. But this is computer-assisted interpretation. And to me, the worst is when, when the patient is so super sensitive, it says abnormally high sensitivity. I know I cannot use that visual field at all. Now, we also have the global indices. The global indices, we have mean deviation and pattern standard deviation. Mean deviation right here is a weighted average of the total deviation. Now, you can't go through and calculate this yourself. Some points closer to fixation are weighted more heavily. Points further out, more peripherally, are weighted less heavily. The machine knows what it's doing, but it gives you an average number. So everything we looked at so far has been point by point by point. This is actually looking at the visual field on an average. So this is, it is a weighted deviation and it is age matched, but it is not corrected for cataract. Very important thing because mean deviation involves glaucoma, retinal disease, and cataract. Meiosis, refractive error, everything is filtered in there. It's just a weighted average of these, of these values. The pattern standard deviation, which is neither positive nor negative. Now, if it's negative, it means the patient is below the average mean deviation for normal person. If it's positive, it's above, and that is getting a little bit dicey. Now, the pattern standard deviation is neither positive nor negative. This is a weighted standard deviation, which compares adjacent points. And by comparing adjacent in a normal visual field, adjacent points are going to be relatively the same. The pattern standard deviation will be low. In a visual field like we see right here, there is focal loss. Points that are adjacent to one another are not similar. There's a great standard deviation between adjacent points. That is indicative of focal visual field loss. So pattern standard deviations that are low might tell us there are is media opacity. Pattern standard deviation that is high tells us there are focal losses in the visual field or focal holes. That's very clear. Now, the visual field index is a new parameter that has been developed for, for progression analyses. And that is looking at the re residual visual field as a percentage of what is still left. And it is determined through a weighted averaging and calculation involving these values here, the average standard deviation. So the visual field index is essentially corrected for age and diffuse depression such as cataract. And that's why it is more useful than a mean deviation when trying to determine progression because if the cataract is thrown in there, you can't really judge progression for glaucoma very well. And as Greg mentioned, uh, we have now the gaze tracker that looks at the patient's fixation throughout the entire test, where small deviation above the line represents air fixation, small deviation above represent blink, and small deviations below represent the machine wasn't quite sure where the patient was. Greg, is there anything you, you think you'd like to expound upon or clarify what I said or add on to? No, I think uh, you you did that well. I think I have a few pearls coming up here that we can uh, talk about as, we, and then we'll just kind of start applying this as we start looking at visual fields. I think you did okay. a great job. Thank you, Greg. So before I go any further, do we have anything in the chat we can talk about? Nope, everything's good. All right, excellent. So I hope, and the Word document that I had, or the, the note document that I had given you explains in detail everything I just said. Greg, you want to talk about the uh, pattern standard deviations, mean deviations, what they all mean? 
Yeah. Do you have my, uh, my, uh, what's the mean deviation of a, yeah. Okay. Let me see. Go ahead and go back. I'll talk about, uh, let's talk about this slide. Go to that, that, let's talk about that slide and then we'll go back. Okay. So Joe did a great job in discussing the, the global indices. What I like to say about mean deviation, it just tells you how deep the uh, mean deviation is. And pattern standard deviation, and, and Joe used the word focal, just how localized or focal it is or how diffuse it is. So, and what, I'm, what we're showing here on, the, um, on the, the right here, mean deviation, there's 54 spots. And if all 54 spots are reduced by one decibel, one times 54 is 54, and there's 54 spots, it would end up being one uh, decibel on a mean deviation. And that's just an example because Joe was talking about how it's weighted. But just to kind of go through, if half of them were reduced by two and the other half were normal, you would still have 27 times two equals 54 divided by 54 would be one. But if you had a quarter of them that were reduced by four, in other words, all of these would show up as a mean deviation of one on the visual field is what I'm trying to show you with this box down here at the bottom. But the pattern standard deviation will tell us how localized it is. So this one here where it's diffuse, you're gonna have a diffuse generalized loss. And as it becomes more localized, all the visual field, half of the visual field, a quarter. And as you go through and you see the pat the, the pattern standard deviation will start become a little bit deeper. And if you can go back that slide now, Joe, we can probably look at some of these visual fields that you had up here. And I can just look at this visual field down here by looking at the mean deviation. This here is a mild visual field. It says minus 2.94. The pattern standard deviation is 2.43. So that means when we go up and we start interpreting this visual field, it's a very mild visual field and the, uh, and the points are diffuse. And as we jump over to the middle one, we all have a very, very uh, uh, severe visual field defect, but it's coming from just a few points when that pattern standard deviation is getting up to 1148. Uh, uh, and it's jumping over to the next visual field. That's just a severe visual field defect but then you go, wait, the pattern standard deviation is really, really low. Yeah, it's because all the points are now involved and it becomes diffusely scattered throughout the whole visual field. So you can use mean deviation and pattern standard deviation to tell you how deep it is and how localized or diffusely spread throughout the visual field. Yeah, that's, it, that's it, all it, I have. Yeah, clear, clearly in, in this, every, you know, there's no focal loss. How how are adjacent points? They're relatively the same. They're all equally bad. So what will happen is you have the roller coaster. If it gets worse, pattern standard, you know, everything gets goes up, goes up, goes up. At a certain point, now the pattern standard deviation comes down. And that brings me to polling question number four. Greg, this a nice picture. Do you recognize where that is? Yes, uh, that is Nashville. Indeed. Right across the bridge, though, is right where that uh, Christmas Day or Christmas Eve bombing took place. Right so what about... is the approximate mean deviation of blind eye? Is it minus 10, minus 22, minus 33, minus 50? I don't know. And I don't know is a good answer because that's what we do. Jeff, some people are having troubles getting the visual field. So in the chat, I'm going to put my Greg at optometric edu.com. That's my email address. I have both of them saved on my computer. If you just email me at greg at optometricedu.com, I'll send you the visual field handouts, both of them, uh, either tonight or tomorrow. All right. Looks like we can end this poll. So what is the approximate mean deviation of a blind eye? One of my favorite things to talk about. Very good. And we have minus 10 at 5%. We have 22. We have minus 33 at 40%, minus 50 at 20%. And the, so that's why we're here. 27% uh, people said, I don't know. 
So this is how this all came about as I was doing a visual field lecture one day, or I was doing something in glaucoma and uh, I was sitting there going, geez, I don't even know what I'm trying to get to. We talk about minus five, we talk about minus 10. And I said, you know, what is the mean deviation of a blind eye? So it was coming back from a lecture. I came in on Monday morning, it'd be like tomorrow, I walked in and I said to one of my technicians, I said, hey, do me a favor, go back and type like 30 or 35 year old in 24 dash two. Don't worry about the phobia being on, just run the visual field for me. And she kind of looked at me and said, doc, have that bad of a weekend, huh? I said, I, no, I want to try and trouble. I, want, I need to answer something. So as you can see here in this visual field on the left, this is someone that's about 30 or 35 years old. You can tell that it's a 24-2 because it only goes superior and inferior and, and temporal 20, uh, uh, 24 degrees, but it goes nasal. And we let the visual field run as if it was a blind eye. Patient never would have hit the button. And you can see here, it says about minus 34. Okay, that's minus 34. Look what happens is that the total deviation, right? Because the patient never responded and it raises the whole visual field up and it almost makes it non-existent, the, the visual field. And you can see here, the pattern standard deviation is telling us that it is diffusely scattered. So that's with that visual field. So I decided to run it here uh, uh, the C to standard uh, in the newer visual field. And the same thing here, it's about minus 33. So I've done it on 35 year olds. I've done it up on 65 year olds. I wanted to see if that made a difference. And someone 65, it's about minus 32. So what I like to think whenever I'm treating someone for glaucoma is I never really want that visual field to get the minus 30 or minus 32. Minus 32 is a blind eye. Now, the next question is, if minus 32 is a blind eye, then is minus 16 half blind? The answer is no, right? The, the, the uh, algorithms that are used here, it's not linear. It's curvilinear. And that's why you'll see that when someone has a minus 10 on a visual field as a mean deviation, that's a severe visual field defect. It's not linear, they're curvilinear. So that's why someone that's minus five has increased car accidents, reads slower, increased depression, all those things that we talk about, increased falls, right? That's just minus five. Minus 10 is a very severe visual field defect. So minus 16 is way beyond being more than half blind. So, so that's just those points. Excellent, excellent uh, description, Greg. And we go back a word about uh, the grayscale. It is useful. Now, if we if we if we were to look only at the pattern deviation, which is something that we have a tendency to do, you know, we we can see the scattered points. But what I like here is whenever I see a blind spot breaking out and stopping there. Now, this patient is a patient with glaucoma and something else. This is a patient who actually has a bitemporal defect. With glaucoma, the first thing you should always ask is where, where is the nasal loss? If there is the nasal loss, we have to start looking for other things. And if I look at the pan deviation, not that impressive. I look at the gray scale, yeah, okay. There is an arc risk of tone because it's glaucoma, but there's also superimposed the bitemporal defect. And again, when I start seeing the blind spot stop right, the, you break out, stop right there, I look at the other eye, do I have something similar? This is a, yeah, right, 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 hem, you know, hemi, hemi uh, left hemianopsy. So it is useful for neurologic diseases. Definitely look at it. And here's a patient that if we, if we only look, if we only look at the, at the grayscale, what do we see here? Okay, I got nasal loss. I'm good with that. Yeah, I got nasal loss. Everything is good. Really dense glaucoma there. You know, there's nasal loss. I look there and, okay, makes all the sense in the world. But I go back to the grayscale, I don't like that. I don't like the way it stops. So I go over here and what do I notice is, yeah, there's an arcuate defect, but when we look at those points, there's a hole within a hole. These are less than zero. I mean, if you look at that, you look at there, that's a right inferior quadrant anopsy of this patient had glaucoma and something else. Yeah, those are great cases of you have to interpret the whole visual field. You use the raw data, 
you use the grayscale, you're really looking at the total and pattern deviations. Yeah, that is, you know, the patient's allowed to have as many diseases as they want, right? We've heard that before. Yeah. Now, the, the R's of visual field, as they call it, they have to be reliable, recognizable, relatable, and reproducible. Reli reliable, we talked about that, the reliability parameters where the gaze tracker, or, you know, what does the perimeter say? You know, we, we're dismissing reliable and unreliable. We're looking at highly useful information to, you know, no useful information. This, and this is a very subjective determination. There's no criteria that we can guide you toward. Recognizable as glaucoma defects rather than something else. Relatable to the anatomy and reproducible. I mean, reproducibility is really, I think, the greatest indicator of reliability. And that can actually show the increase the likelihood that in a quote unquote insignificant defects actually significant. Now we take a look at this, and you know, there's there's my magic right there: abnormally high sensitivity. We've got white scotomas, and you know, maybe you know, maybe this is how it should be represented on the visual field instead of black. But a white scotoma, you know, what's going on here? False positive, fifty-four percent. Total de pattern deviation is worse than total. It shouldn't be that, that way. Pattern should be the same or better. The reason is, if we look at you know some of these values, they're in the 40s and 50s. As Greg said, they can't exist. But more normal values when compared to 40s and 50s are depressed. That's why it gives us this pseudo depression. Abnormally high sensitivity, a mean deviation of, of, of a plus. You know, plus four is not going to happen in, in a real situation. Maybe a plus one, maybe a plus 1.25, but anything beyond that is just physiologically impossible. This is a totally garbage visual field we can't use. I mean, jeepers, false positives are 96%. Almost everything is 50. The patient clearly doesn't understand the test. Excessive high false positives, abnormally high sensitivity. We can't use this at all. In more examples, when the pattern deviation is worse than the total deviation, should be the other way around, it means there are values out there that are so high that normal values in comparison look abnormally low. These, when you have the white scotomas, they're just useless. And of course, when you have the butterfly or the clove relief, that's, that's a sign the patient's falling asleep. Do you want to talk about that, Greg? Yeah, um, basically what's happening here is the that's going back and, and testing the spots. In this case here, the, the butterfly visual field, uh, when the patient is sitting there taking the visual field and they're thinking about why am I doing this? They didn't explain it to me that well. Do I really need to be doing this? I could be balancing my checkbook. I could be doing this. And they're kind of zoned out. When the lights go off in the center, they see it. And when they're out in the periphery, because they're thinking about everything else, it just shows up black. So that's why you kind of get that butterfly or, or clover visual feel because, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be hitting a button when I see a light and they're thinking about everything else in the world. So that's why, you know, we try to make sure, you know, like tomorrow I might not do any visual fields. Everyone lost that extra hour of sleep, right? So are they well rested? And, you know, and, and I'm joking, but the point is, is that when we do a visual field, we want the patient to be well aware, well coached, you know, don't be going to sleep. Don't be thinking about all the worries in the world. Please focus on this. And my technician knows that because she'll know I'll have them go back and do it again, right? Because I need reliable data if we're going to be making medical decisions. So, you know, we just kind of pump the patient up a little bit. So that's why they get that kind of that clover leaf is because they're thinking about a million things. They can see it in the center and you get that clover leaf pattern, but it's very indicative of false negatives. And, and these right here, these four points are the ones that are, are tested first. And the patient may have been alert, they were good, and then they drifted off. You know, we like the gaze tracker. Here's one, you know, a deviation above means they had an air fixation. A uh, small deviation above is a blink, and a small deviation below means they wasn't sure where, where the eye was. And here's a person who's a little bit nervous, but they actually settled down pretty well. Uh, and this is really ideal. I mean, it, it, it's practically flat. You know, when I see these, I want to see the, the plains of Kansas. I don't want to see the Manhattan skyline like we have here. And for, you know, 
for for goodness sakes, I'm, I'm not really sure on getting what what it was even in the room. I'm, I'm not sure about that. One. That brings me to polling question number five. Greg, what is that? That looks familiar. Yep. Do I need to relaunch it? Hold on. Okay. Continue. There we go. I think it's working now. Is it working? Yep. I'm, I, I was looking forward to this one. All right. Th this B J E R R U M scotoma is another term for an artery defect. How do you pronounce that word? The B is silent and it's jera, or the B is hard and it's bajera, or neither. And Joe, you asked where this uh, campfire is. It looks like in the back here, it looks like Mummy Mountain, and this looks like uh, Scottsdale, uh, Paradise Valley, Arizona. Indeed. So is it Bajaran or is it Jaron? I was actually looking at Greg, I've been looking forward to this all night, this polling question all night. <laughs> yeah, I, I put this uh, polling question in and uh, I. Uh, Knowing you well, uh, I, I figured this would be your favorite of them all. So, mm -hmm. all right, all looks right. like everyone or most of the people have weighed in. So, let's get the answer. All right, the B is silent and it's pronounced Jerem, or the B is hard and it's pronounced Bajerem, or 5% said neither is correct and 5% is right. It is Bayer Runes Katoma. So, it's not Jerem. It's not Bajera, it is Bayer Rooms Katoma. So now you know something, I'm gonna wager your local glaucoma specialist doesn't know. So you can go you can go surprise her or him with that uh, that little fat word. Recognizable relative scotomas, fluctuating scotomas, absolute scotomas, scare paracentral defects, nasal steps, archer scotomas, or what we now know as Bayer Rooms scotomas. Alpha TV defects, the, the general depression and diffuse loss, that's media, that's refraction, that's cataract, that's not luck. And nice examples here we have a paracentral defect primarily. We have a bit of a nasal step. Now that inferior arc root scotoma right here, we have an inferior arc root of Bayerunum scotoma combined with some nasal loss above as well. The important thing to understand is this is not one defect. And because of the orientation of the, of the nerve fiber layer, if we have above and below the horizontal rafe, unless the patient's head was severely tilted, that represents damage on both poles of the disc just more severe damage superiorly than inferior. And a nice example of one might call a nasal step. It does, it's not really totally contiguous with the blind spot and perhaps a paracentral defect. These are all recognizable as being glaucomas. Now this is outside normal limits. We have, a, I also sometimes call them superior heavy field defects. You know, it's in the superior hemifield or the inferior hemifield. No, go back one visual field. Sure. So I just like to point out that, you know, it's a great visual field defect. It's 4.75. That's, you know, zero to five is mild, five to 10 is moderate, and above 10 is severe. So you're still in a mild defect, but look how localized it is, or as Joe would say, the adjacent points uh, are, you know, different. But you can see there that. You know, that mild, almost moderate defect is very localized. And if you, Joe, if you want to go up and point that you know, there's nasal, you know, three or four in the raw data, zero, 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 and then there's a one down below there, it looks like, you know, those are the few points that are leading to that. And that's why it's so localized or focal. Here, here you have a, what, a minus two that's diffusely scattered, still a, a, a glaucomatous visual field not as deep and kind of just kind of scattered throughout that nasal field defect, as Joe pointed out, superior and inferior, not as localized. And then and this one here is four. And again, just kind of a four on the pattern standard deviation. Go ahead and take it, Joe. And the important thing I want to, that we, 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 we would be remiss if we didn't say something is you can't make a diagnosis off a visual field. You can only say if you believe that it is glaucomatous or non-glaucomatous because Retinal disease can do this. 
neurologic disease can do this. I mean, there are a number of things that can do. We can't make a diagnosis off the visual field. We, only, we can only correlate it to the anatomy. And of course, we're having you know, the more arcuate and paracentral defect or what may, one may call an altitudinal defect. I, I don't really use that term very, very commonly. A very, very dense nasal step, paranasal step for Brahme, meaning that when you go from the superior to the inferior, it's essentially as you cross the horizontal, you're stepping into a hole in the nasal field. That's where nasal step comes from. And we have a pure paracentral defect here. We can see the B deviation is minus four, four. The Patterson deviation is pretty high at, at seven, almost seven and a half. And that's not a very big visual field defect, but here a budding fixation is a zero. This is advanced field loss. And when we have this, we now must add in a 10 degree field because if there's changes in these six degree points, we're not going to see it. We need to look for changes in the two degree points. So now this is a patient who has earned himself or herself two visual fields per eye in this eye. And we can see, you know, nasal loss, arc as it arcs around fixation and a paracentral with, with arcuate nasal, or you can say that's all one defect, but we also want to point out is this dense paracentral defect. Mean deviation is only at 653. Visual field, there's 79% of the visual field still left because that point is left that one, any of these four points, zero or less than zero, you have severe field loss. You have, you have advanced disease. And here are some patternless visual fields that we have to be very careful about. You know, edge, edge points, you know, these are all edge points. Now, here's, here's a true nasal loss. When you have a field defect like this and you have a zero above and a zero below, that's, that's either nose or trial lens. This is actually more impressive to me than any of these four out here. We're not, we're not edge points, okay? We don't have edge points. We're in a, a glaucoma zone. Visual field index is at still 97%. Mean deviation is not very low. Patterson deviation is pretty significant, though. So the, some of these points are, are, are pretty disparate. And this is a whole lot more impressive to me than any of the four that I had just shown you. Now, here's something else but to look at is look at, at sequential visual fields. There's small defects here in the superior hemi field. And these are edge points, but it's in the superior hemi field. Here we're in the superior hemi field. And the earliest glaucoma change that we're going to see is that small, shallow fluctuating scotoma. We don't have to look at the exact same points. In the same general area, repetitively is very compelling. Here's a patient, inferior defect, inferior defect, normal inferior defect. Three in a row or three out of four in the same general area is enough for me. This point is not damaged in glaucoma. That point is not damaged in glaucoma. The whole hemifield has been damaged. And as the degree disease progresses, these defects get larger, deeper, and more consistent. But when they're fluctuating like this, we have to look at several visual fields. That's the small, shallow, fluctuating scotoma that's beginning in early glaucoma. And of course, when we get to advanced disease like that, where the visual field index of only 7%, we can't really use this to follow disease. Now we have to abandon the 24. And we have to go to the 10 degree field. And I will tell you that if you're looking for progression in 10 degree fields, we need a lot of them. You probably need to be doing visual fields at 10 degrees every six months because they can be variable. And here's what we have, cataract and no cataract. We can certainly see there is a general reduction of sensitivity. We see a total deviation, which is pretty significant, but not much of a pattern deviation. So when the cataract is removed, total deviation is looking a whole lot better. 
And even those small points in there, even, you know, one may say, yeah, there's still a heavy field defect. When the cataract is dense, it isn't perfect. There can still be some residual retrolenticular loss that isn't properly accounted for. We can certainly see it's truly not there when the cataract is, is post-op. Greg, do you have any comments on anything I just said? No. You want, anything all, you want to add? No, it was all good. Yep. Yeah, so, you know, what, Greg, I'm, I'm just going to kind of throw this one. You know, what, what can you tell us? What, what are we seeing? Uh, I don't know. Let's go look at the visual field in index. It's showing us about 90%, if I can see the numbers. 89, uh, yep. Yep, 89. Uh, uh, outside normal limits, we have a moderate visual field defect. It's localized. Um, Fovea is off. Uh, looking at the gaze monitor, it's you know, a little bit of some eye movement, but not too, too bad. And it looks like uh, I can't see the false positives, Joe. So can you tell me the numbers on the false, false positives? False positives are at 8%. The false negatives are at 7%. Fixation losses are five out of 18 and it's flagged. That's why it says low reliability because of fixation losses. Yeah, very rarely do I ever look at that. I jump down to the gaze monitor. Um, so yeah, you got a visual field defect here that's that's moderate. And like you said, you can't uh, can't say that it's always from glaucoma. You got a, you know, you got a, it could be anywhere from optic nerve to behind the optic nerve to the retina causing this visual field defect. Yeah, so fixation losses are high. It tells us that it's not reliable. We look at the case pattern, it looks pretty darn good. Total deviation is quite a bit worse than pattern, so there's a decent amount of cataract in there. Mean deviation is a minus eight, that's pretty significant. Pattern stand deviation is about five to four. So there's focal loss. So this tells us that there's really a lot of things going on, but clinical correlation is very important. We have to recognize things. You know, this is a patient who had been treated for glaucoma in various facilities. She was a, a doctor shop and she brought all of her records with her. And I looked at the records and it said, you know, pressure excellent, disc pallor, both eyes, old long standing familiar optic atrophy, considered neuro ophthalmology consult, current, you know, continued current medications. The problem is she's going to different doctors all the time. We take a look at this and if we look at the pattern deviation, we can certainly see that there looks like there is superior arthritic defects. But you know, what do I what do I notice here? Well, look at that. See how it kind of stops there. I look at my global my 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 grayscale. So I have to look over there and it kind of crosses over. I can see a whole lot denser. And I'll repeat it. What do I see? Clearly, superior bitemporal defect. So this was. Not normal tension glaucoma. It wasn't old, long-standing familial optic atrophy. Patient so you're saying that alpha gan P is not going to treat this? It is not going to treat. Not not even latanoprost, <laughs> the drug of champions. <laughs> we want to be relatable. Here's a patient with inferior neurofibrillar layer defect, inferior disc hemorrhage, inferior notching. And what do I see there? There's a nasal defect. What I expect to see. You know, it all relates. And here's our fellow eye larger wedge defect, more rim compromise, and we have superior defects both in the nasal zone and the paracentral zone. And because it's less than zero on each side, we say they're splitting fixation. And this is a patient we have to be very fastidious about because this is a person that could actually lose their central acuity. Now, I, I, I probably managed her for about 20 years and I have, I have passed her on to my successor when I left the university and she's still doing very well. Yeah, that person would have a difficulty time reading um, both if, eyes if, trying to get lined up. They're going to have, even though the other eye might still be good, they're going to have a difficult time reading. Mm -hmm. And don't call all depression isolated missed points if there's a structural correlate. You know, here's two points and one or two points does not a diagnosis make unless the nerve anatomy or nerve fiber layer anatomy supports that that may actually be an early scotoma. Here's a patient, uh, the glaucoma hemifield test is within normal limits. There's only a few points in there. Very low mean deviation, very low pattern standard deviation, but on a nerve analysis, 
we can see that there's a neurofiber layer defect, and we can see the rib is really, uh, really compromised there. So even though the GHT is within normal limits, these points are actually you know, very legitimate. That brings me to polling question number six, Greg. I know you recognize this, this scene. Where, where is that? Tell yeah, me where that's, that, is. Uh, that is Quebec City, one of Joe's favorite places here. Um, is that the Frontenac? Did I say that? The hotel the at the top? The Chateau Frontenac is right there, and that's a formiculaire taking from lower town to upper town. And it says right there, funiculaire, right on the building right below it. Um, Joe, we have a question that's in there. It came to yeah. me directly, and it says, in talking to patients, when do you use the visual field index? Um, I use the visual field index all the time. Um, they, when I do a visual field, let's say I'm maybe doing a neuro, looking for a neuro defect, visual field defect, uh, visual field index is just like a gas gauge, 100% full down to zero. Um, it's just a, it's a mean deviation on steroids. Um, it takes into account, takes out of the account, the pupil size and different things. So it's a little bit more reliable if you want to say. So it's just hundred percent is good and 0% is parametric blindness. So I'll just say to the patient, Hey, look, we did your visual field today. We thought there might be a concern in the back. Good news is you're sitting at hundred percent in this eye, you're hundred percent in that eye. Okay, that makes me feel a little bit better. So that's what visual field index is. Yeah, I mean, it's designed for progression analysis, which I don't think we will get to this evening. We're a little bit too, I was a little too ambitious on this lecture, but it's something that patients can understand. Now, what is the earliest visual field change in glaucoma? Which see people, I think I did, I did make it, uh, I did make mention of this. Is it a nasal step? Is it a paracentral defect? Is it an artery defect? a small, shallow, fluctuating scotoma, or I'm not sure, which of course is a, an answer because why we're here to learn. We touched on this a couple times, but we can use this question to kind of to, to kind of drive home a point or two here. And so I'm going to end the poll. Going to share the results, and there they are. If you want to go over them, Joe. Yeah, nasal step. We, we, that is that is a definitive glaucoma type of, of, of defect. Paracentral defects also occur. Artery defects are, are more more uh, extensive in, in labor disease. But the small, shallow flux range we tell them that small depression in in the same general quadrant that is there. It's not exact, you repeat it, it's still there, and then you repeat it, it's not there, then you repeat it, then it comes back. You know, that fluctuation, because as Greg said, the, 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 the gang cells are not dead, they are dying, they're trying to survive, and they have highly variable sensitivity. So it's hard to recognize, but it's one of the earliest things that, that we would see. And there's, if you did full threshold visual fields, the short term fluctuation, the earlier than that, but we just don't do that anymore. It's all about those retinal ganglion cells that are slightly wounded. You catch them on a bad day, they show up, then they are able to recover, and then it shows up somewhere else because you got a wounded, and then eventually the glaucoma sets in, the ganglion cells die, and you get that kind of repeatable, what we were taught, that repeatable visual field defect. But the earliest is a shallow, small, or a small, shallow fluctuating scotoma. Kind of like what we, what we see here. You know, don't call them isolated missed points if they're they're repeatable. Now, the glaucoma hemifield test was was within normal limits in all these visual fields. Now, maybe, maybe this this one may actually have been borderline, but quadrant, quadrant, quad one, two, three. Judges, was this patient treated from 2007 to 2009? Do you know? Do you recall? No, they were. They were not. They were seeing different doctors at different, you know, each time. And this could be. I don't really have the mean deviation of the pattern, but I've seen patients where in 2007, that could have been a minus five uh, defect on mean deviation, and you treat them, you take the stress off, and you can see them get better because now the ones that were kind of partially wounded had recovered, and you can see a visual field slightly improved. That that can happen. Uh, it's not going to go from a five to a zero, but you can go from like a five to a four. So, 
and this is just an, an example for what I, I always like to say: don't you know? Don't don't uh, don't make snap decisions based upon on one thing. Here, it's a pretty good looking visual feel. You got a smattering of points of very low statistical significance, but if we compare it against the previous visual fields, we can see there's a certain consistency there. So you may actually catch a patient on a very good day and easily, and you can easily miss a, a true sarcoma. And this is a person who's got 2050 vision with a very advanced disease. You know, as you say, they're parametrically blind. There's the there's the 30, you know, 32 decibel uh, drop off, but there's his visual field. And this is a 10 degree, and this, this allows the patient to see 2050 vision. So obviously we can't use this any further. We can actually just uh, just use this. And here's a patient uh, with very advanced disease at a very young age. She was in her, she was in her, uh, uh, I think early 30s or late 20s or early, with advanced juvenile open angle glaucoma. And they, they're her optic nerves. We can see these are, are her visual fields. These are 10 degree fields. And she's, you know, 20, 20 each eye, but not, you know, not, uh, not functional. She, she actually uses her young children to help guide her. Joe, to help yeah. uh, connect some dots here for the audience and the attendees, um, would a uh, would a uh, nerve fiber layer and GCC be helpful here, or what are you relying more on this patient? Ten degree fields. Now, what what frustrates me is, in you know, there there have been times where I I have had to or, or, or sent a person like this for a surgical consultation. We're very close to this, you know, for, for surgical consultation. And the first thing they run is a, an OCT. <laughs> now, my analogy here is to run an OCT on, on a patient like this is akin to taking the pulse on a decapitated person to see if they're dead. They're dead. We don't need to check the pulse and blood pressure. And visual fields in terms of progression, you know, they, they get worse in, 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 in three different ways. They can get denser, deeper. They can get more extensive or what is normal becomes abnormal. And that's how visual field gets worse. And here's an example where the defect actually gets denser. You can see the numbers drop off over time. Here's a patient angle recession glaucoma pressure 47. Patient non compliant, compliant with the medicine, declined surgery. He's not very fastidious about coming in. One medicine brings the pressure down, covered by insurance, uh, no adverse effects. Starts off like this, goes to this, goes to this. So we have getting worse in three different ways. New. Clean visual field becomes abnormal. Abnormal visual field becomes deeper. Abnormal field, visual field becomes more extensive. And that's how visual fields get worse. And I don't know if you remember, ever saw the movie Driving Miss Daisy. Uh, I know of it. I never saw it. I call this Mrs. Daisy Driving. She has angle recession left eye from blood trauma several years ago. Peak pressure 47, you know, coincidentally enough. And uh, when she gets that high, she develops a paint fly with corneal edema. She has hyperemic to travertan and sample her on, on Zyoptin. Yeah, it was better. Uh, but she only used like three drops of Zyoptin, came back uh, 11 months later, 2018, and uh, one of 19 looking like that. And the interesting thing I call is Miss Daisy Drive, she told, she told me. That would she she also would she would like to, you know, she liked to when she was driving, she liked to cover her good eye to see how well she could drive with her bad eye. So that allowed me to coin or caused me to coin the phrase, I think that the trauma that causes an angry recession also causes brain damage. Greg, I don't know if I have anything else I want to, I want to say. Uh, I think we're, we're a little bit ambitious about things. Uh, I think we had a good discussion here. We want to look at a lot of good things about visual fields. Are there any questions in the chat box? Yeah, actually one just popped in and it yeah. says, 
when a patient has end-stage glaucoma, are visual fields or COTS, COTS even covered? Uh, OCTs probably instead of COTS. So visual fields or OCTs even covered if the only goal is very low IOP, like less than 12. Visual fields will be covered. OCT for advanced disease uh, by Medicare guidelines and photographs by Medicare guidelines won't be covered in advanced disease. If you're coding advanced glaucoma or severe, then you uh, they won't they they won't be reimbursed. They probably aren't necessary. And I agree. You can't judge you can't just change in a 95% cup covered by photographs or OCT, but visual fields will be covered because we can do 10 degree fields. What do you do about a patient who has high pressures and family history of glaucoma, but doesn't have insurance and doesn't want to go to a specialist? Nerve heads look okay intact. Okay, so high pressures. Patient has higher pressures, mm -hmm. family history of glaucoma, okay. mm -hmm. um, doesn't want to go to a specialist, mm -hmm. and nerve heads look okay and intact and then the caveat then would be you know patient doesn't have insurance okay. well in a situation like that i i think presumptively we're looking at ocular hypertension uh i don't know if you're going to get a, an oct or or a, or a visual field in a situation like that uh if a patient will not uh, be able to afford that they, they're uninsured they they may decline the test in that situation, I think we have to make a determination as to what, what might be best. Now, if we have a pressure of 23 and a, a 0.2 CV ratio, I probably have, I'm probably not going to do a heck of a lot. Now, you've got a 0.4 or 4.5 CV ratio. It looks, still looks pretty good. But your pressure is maybe a, a 29, 28 or 29. And let's say maybe they won't allow you to do even pachymetry. I think with the limitations that you have using a generic beta blocker or a generic prostaglandin is probably a reasonable thing to do. I mean, beta that's blocker. a tough question. I mean, that comes in a little bit of practice management. And yeah, we have patients that come in all the time that don't have insurance. You know, I think the first thing we would do is, let, you know, we're going to narrow down our tests. It's a family history. I'm probably going to be doing something more OCT, nerve fiber layer. Probably wouldn't need a visual field. Try and get an optic nerve head photo. And yeah, you know, I think the, the key would be is, is try and set the patient up on a payment plan, explain to them that you're not going to run every test under the gamut. You know, I feel very comfortable as Joe does following glaucoma um, with the minimum amount of testing, but the proper amount of testing um, and then try and sum up on a payment plan. But, you know, if they're truly down and out and they want to share some financials with the, with the practice, you know, then we kind of run them through in a sense our indigent program. And we just write off some of these things, but uh, you know that comes down a little bit more practice management. Patient is ocular hypertensive, like Joe said, and they need to be followed as if someone had insurance. So that's that would be, uh, you know, the way I would handle it in the practice. Um, let's see. Uh, are you doing visual field more than once a year for glaucoma? The answer is going to be depending on the severity and a mild glaucoma once a year. The more advanced especially those 10-2s, we could do those up to three or four times a year. Joe, what are your thoughts? I like to do visual fields at least twice a year, to be honest with you. I'm, and so, still, I'm, still, getting, I'm still getting into my rhythm right now in my practice. Uh, one thing that I, I have noted in my new practice, it's a very large practice, but uh, I've never challenged if I no charge something. So if I have to do a 24-2, I will do it and I will, I will bill for it. And then the next visit, I may have to do 10-2, and I can't go for it. It's too soon, but I need the test. I don't want to do necessarily do the test on the same day as the 24-2, and I will no charge for that. But I think uh, with Medicare, you're allowed twice, twice a year. Um, I think Annette was making a comment that blind people find working difficult. Yep, I agree. That might be in response to maybe an earlier question. Uh, Bonnie said, thank you. Um, Private direct message, kind of with regarding visual fields, laser versus topical treatment. I'm sure we're going back to uh, treating glaucoma. Mm -hmm. Laser versus topical. Uh, I'm a bit of a nihilist. I, I don't think laser is the answer. 
I, I see laser done a, a fair amount with you know relatively you know some in some cases unimpressive responses. Certainly not for advanced disease. Maybe as a first line therapy. Uh, I'm a I'm a topical sort of person. I like I like doing I like doing topical things. Mary replied that was the question earlier with the earlier discussion that the pressures were 34. I wrote an RX for a cheaper med and brought the pressures down. I agree. The pressures needed to be down if no testing, um, or you could not lower the pressure and follow them through testing. Nice presentation, helpful, you're welcome. Uh, how soon should you repeat a visual field if it appears suspicious at baseline, uh, but reliability was questionable? I'll take a stab at that, Joan, then you can fill in the gaps is, because mm -hmm. Joan, I, I practice in Pennsylvania, Joe practices in Florida. And as someone was asking earlier about, <clears throat> um, getting and how many visual fields you do there's times when i'll do um you know a visual field uh, almost at every visit now do i charge them no but what we're trying to do is establish that baseline so depending on the case sometimes i'll do a visual field three in a year maybe bill for the one but what i'm trying to do is build that baseline in there getting the patient taught and then doing other testing when the patient comes in maybe taking a disc photo doing gonioscopy so on and so forth um, but, you know, early on, you can try and get, uh, there's some docs that do a visual field every month for three months to try and get that baseline down. Um, so, yeah. so go ahead, Joe. I, I think, I think a, a consensus has been in the glaucoma society that you need about six fields in the first two years to really figure out what's going on in terms of how quickly they're progressing. Question came in, do we have any handouts for the Esterman? Um, thanks in advance. Um, good, pre great presentation. Um, I might have something, if you email me, I might have something on Esterman, um, Visual Fields. Joe, do you have anything? I do not. Okay. Uh, when do you change drops or add meds or orals? Orals, orals are not common. Uh, I mean, chronically, they, they're not well tolerated. Patients, uh, patients get sick. Although probably we, we, we overdose them on orals, probably a one, one 250 diamox a day might be acceptable. Uh, when, when do I change uh, medicines? It would, all, it would sort of depend on what, my, what their initial pressure is, what their target pressure is, and what is their rate of progression. That's, uh, that's a... That's a that's another lecture in itself, I think. All right. And then uh, Bonnie, uh, 1995 classmate, uh, reports uh, one of my patients had visual field, of, uh, a lot of visual field uh, defect um, from uh, glaucoma and MS. So, again, the patient is allowed to have as many diseases as they want. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the audience is telling us uh, no more questions and they're saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. So let me share uh, the final closing uh, slides here, Joe. Mm -hmm. And I think I can do this in this. And thanks everyone uh, for taking uh, visual fields or fields, follies and uh, perimetry pearls. It was our pleasure, uh, myself and Dr. Saka, to present uh, this course for you. And uh, I don't see any other questions and a lot of thank yous coming in. Uh, and it was our pleasure.